This is the recording for the Unit 7 Post Lab. Whoa, let's try this again here. So question one, obviously you did attend the lab intensive. There it is. And you just say you acknowledge that you did attend it. Then question two, look at the motivation in the lab manual itself and when you check these out. I don't know why it's doing this. I would apologize for it, but I don't know why it's doing this here. It's just scrambling around. Anyway, uh, you check the motivation in Ohm's Law. That's where I'm going to start out with here in this post lab. And you will see that the ones that I checked here make sense. All electrical appliances, resistors, Ohm's Law, circuit components, and so on. And the other two here, they don't make sense. So question three, Ohm's law resistors. I believe these are in the correct and in the correct order. So let's just check it. The first two bands of a four-banded resistor designate the first two digits of the resistor's value. I don't think we have we have you used five-banded resistors. The second to last bands meaning is a decimal multiply the exponent of the ten with what with which the first digits are multiplied, the number of times a decimal point is shifted. There are several ways of expressing that. The last band significance is the tolerance. That is how accurate the resistor's value is. In the correct order of the color code representing 0 through 9 for resistors is black, brown, red, orange, and so on. So you have the rainbow in here, and then it's preceded by black and brown, and then you have gray and white at the end. All right. So for parallel resistors, still on this law, for parallel circuit containing five different resistors, with these resistances, compute the total resistance. So, of course, you have to add the reciprocal of these, and then come up with the answer. Little hint: your result should be less than 240 ohms in this case here. And by the way, you might have different numbers. So, for a parallel circuit, you always add the resistors in as reciprocals. And when you're done, you come up with a really small number, 0 0.0 something. You have to invert that one more time, as you learned at the lab. This is a typical question where I'm testing that people understood what was going on in the lab and are able to do this kind of calculation. And then again, the result for this one here ought to be less than the smallest resistance. OK, and again, you might have different numbers there. OK, question. This question here for Ohm's law. They're mostly in the correct order. I believe it's A through F. And then the last one is actually one that takes another statement and reuses it. So let's just check it out. Total equivalent resistance in a series circuit is to sum on individual, individual resistances. Yes. You will probably got that out of it. The total or equivalent resistance in the parallel circuit is the sum of the reciprocals of the individual resistances invert again. I just said that about a minute ago. The value of the total or equivalent resistance in the parallel circuit is always smaller than the value of the smallest individual resistance. I also just said that the power consumed by each element in a series circuit is rather small, as can be seen by the dimly lit lamps and by the resistors consuming relatively little power. The power consumed by each element of parallel circuit is rather large, as can be seen by the rather bright lamps and by the resistors consuming a relatively large amount of power. This one here does make sense for anything that is wired in your household, because anything that you have there is connected in parallel, and they have to have that power in order to work. Otherwise, if your microwave or your blender or whatever it is all of a sudden consumes less power because they're wired in series with each other, well, that wouldn't make sense. So yes, anything that is wired in a parallel circuit has to have the same amount of power, and that's kind of what you got out of that lab. If you switched any two of the already placed resistor in a series circuit with each other, then the total or equivalent resistance would remain virtually unchanged within measurement errors. Totally unchanged, but I said virtually unchanged because you will have some measurement errors. If you switch any two of uh, resistors in parallel with each other, the same thing happens. So if you had switched them, it didn't the order didn't matter when you measured them. Either way, either case, you would measure the same 
thing. Of course, what you measure here is not the same what you measure here. What it means is that if you switch any two of these are in series, then you measure the same thing. If you met, if you met, switch any two of the ones in parallel, then you met, measure the same thing as you did in parallel previously. Okay. Let's see, question six, Ohm's law, concepts. There are some being reused here. So again, this is what you should have gotten out of the lab, that when you hook resistors up in series, then the voltages add up. In series, electric currents are the same through each element. In series, resistances add up. Now we're going to go to parallel circuits and parallel voltages are the same on each element. That's why I have this on or through here, because on applies to voltages, while the through here apply to the electric currents in series. And parallel electric currents add, and again, you got this all out of the lab if you did it properly and got good results. And the last one, in parallel resistances, must be inverted to yield the reciprocal of the total. All right, for the conclusion here, you simply have to say that we type the conclusion into our lab report. And then the next question is on capacitance. Again, look at the motivation for that in the lab manual, and you will see that these three make sense, and the others about torques and so on don't make sense for this lab. The motivation is the reason behind the motivation is so that students see, okay, we're not just doing a physics lab, but we're actually using that for some other things. In this case, it's all kinds of electrical applications. They're, not all of them are using capacitors, but some of them do, and that's, that's what I try to point out here. And of course, resistances, the one Ohm's law, that applies to any electric circuit. So, that's what the point is behind the motivation. It goes beyond the physics lab and what we're using in the real world. Capacitance, so concepts that we try to get across. So these are mostly in the correct order. So let's see, during charging, discharging capacitor, what happens to the measured voltage as time increases, the measured voltage increases or decreases in the case of discharging less and less with time because charging and discharging capacitor follows an exponential law, which is what you then got from Excel. How could the value of an unknown capacitance be determined in this experiment? By measuring and determining the time constant and dividing that by the given Resistance, actually Excel did that for you, but it's in the theory part as well in the lab. In series, add the reciprocals of the capacitance in parallel, add the capacitance themselves. That's the opposite of what happens to resistances. Again, you should have gotten that from when you looked, when, when you did um, the capacitance in parallel and series that, oh, they behave opposite of that what resistances do. So for a series circuit containing two different capacitors with capacitance, compute the total capacitance, and actually that should read the equivalent capacitance. And when you do that, you have the reciprocals of 1,500 and 2,200. You come up with something that is less than the smallest one, so you come up with somewhere around 890. And of course, give it a try. And if you used actually these two, resistances in the lab with, in, in series with, with the capacitances, then you will con you have come up with something really s similar to that. Again, that's, these questions are to test your understanding of what was going on in the lab itself. Using the experimental setup in this lab experiment, explain why the exponent is important for determining capacitance. So that's where it gets out of order here. The exponent is the reciprocal of the RC time constant tau, and that divided by the resistances yields the capacitance. Notice that this one here says RC time constant tau. Unfortunately, in physics, we have to sometimes double up on symbols. So the tau here for the time constant in an RC circuit turns out to actually be also a tau that is described as a torque. That's just a coincidence here. Okay, if you apply this calculation correctly where you divide the time constant or true exponent of 0 0.0294 by the 33,000 ohms, you will come up with 
8.9 times 10 to the negative 7, which is the same as 890 microfarads. So again, it's um, done the same way. You f again find it in the theory part in the lab manual, and Excel actually did it for you during the lab. All right, this one here for a series circuit containing two different capacitors. Again, because it's serious, for capacitors, they behave like resistors in parallel. So for these two numbers, you have to add the reciprocals and then invert again. And if you just happen to have these two numbers, notice they're really close to each other. And the outcoming capacitance, total capacitance of the coolant capacitance is going to be really close to 1,400 microfarad because they're really close to each other. They're two, just divide by two. If you have different numbers, well, you really have to do the calculation different. And again, it tests that you understood the calculation in the lab itself. All right, let's see the errors. In this case, I have errors here for both labs that you did for, for this unit because they're they're same. I mean, we use the same kind of measurement apparatus. So measuring time, that was for the capacitance one. The circuit components are not perfect, so capacitance or resistance are manufactured with a certain tolerance. The voltage current resistance measurements contain a small random error, and the multimeter may produce systematic errors for voltage, and having a low battery could also produce some current, um, uh, wrong results for current measurements. So, oops, that should be clicked here. These could be a little bit randomized, so check these out when, when you look at these. Let's see, I only checked three. Let's see if that's true. Actually, there should be four. Which one did I miss? Oh, here. I accidentally and clicked that one. I'm trying this again. I don't know why it's doing this kind of like switching forth and back. There we go. All right. And I believe this is the last one, yeah, very long one about the conclusion. So the capacitance lab, you're not writing a conclusion, but I'm giving you an example conclusion here. This, the statements on the left-hand side are actually in the correct order. And so you would, so all these five here, I believe it is, are in the correct order. You just have to see, look at the way a conclusion should be written. Um, how these apply. I believe these are randomized on the right hand side. So here, listen carefully, for three capacitors in parallel, I obtain an equivalent and so on if, if I was the student. And then I go over here. Well, that matches up with simply listing my results or examples of my results. Then the next statement here is for my hypothetical conclusion when adding the three individual capacitors, the theoretical 790 ohms compares to the measured and computed 800 microfarad obtained from the data and graphs. And that, of course, coincides with comparing your results right here. So I'm not going to put ABC in here because I believe these statements on the right hand side are actually randomized. Very favorable to my measuring computer results. If I had supplied more data and so on, they would have shown it my and so on and so on. And that would be an assessment of the results, i.e. commenting on the comparison. Then it certainly seems that capacitors simply add when placed and so on. If I had supplied example, I would probably have determined that the resistance and so on. That goes under further outcomes of the lab. And then finally, both my timer, in this case, my cell phone and my multimeter contain very small error and measuring time and so on and so on and so on. And that would then be obviously an, an error analysis. So that's how you would have to match them between the statements on the left and the statements on the right. And that's the recording for the post lab seven.